Hi, everyone. Buenas noches. Buenas. So we're going to start soon. Vamos a comenzar pronto. Uh, but we'd like to start by inviting uh, the interpreters, uh, Catalina and Sabina, to tell you a little bit about um, how to access Spanish interpretation tonight. Welcome. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Gracias. Hola, muy buenas noches. Estamos proveyendo interpretación del español al inglés y del inglés al español para esta sesión el día de hoy. Hello, good evening. We are providing interpretation from Spanish to English and English to Spanish for this session today. Mi nombre es Sabina y mis pronombres, este, o mi pronombre es ella, y estoy... Estoy aquí hoy con mi compa y con intérprete Catalina. Sus pronombres son ella y ella. Somos miembros del colectivo de justicia del lenguaje Pancha Lenguas basada en Pulbancha, Luisiana. My name is Sabina and my pronoun is are she hers. And I'm joined today by my comrade and co-interpreter Catalina, whose pronouns are she and they. We are members of Pancha Lenguas Language Justice Collective based in Pulbancha, Luisiana. Bulbancha es la palabra Choctaw que significa la tierra donde se habla muchos lenguajes. Bulbancha is the Choctaw word which means the land where many languages are spoken. Como trabajadores de justicia del lenguaje, nos esforzamos a crear un espacio para que todos aquí presentes puedan entender y ser entendidos en el idioma en que nos sentimos más poderosos. As language justice workers, we strive to create a space for everyone here to understand and be understood in the language in which we feel most powerful. If you would like to listen to today's webinar in Spanish, you can change your language preference here in Zoom, which will be turned on now. Si desea escuchar el seminario web de hoy en español, puede cambiar su preferencia de idioma aquí en Zoom, que estará activado ahora. Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you. And you know, let me say very quickly, um, for those listening and for whom, uh, I think Catalina, you, well, as our, our uh, interpreter said, we're hoping to provide, right, we're providing Spanish for people for whom uh, Spanish is a language with, with which they feel most powerful. This is not uh, unique to this, um, to this program. This is something we intend to keep doing. So if you know such people, uh, who would be interested in participating, uh, please let them know that we will be providing Spanish language interpretation on an ongoing basis. From now on, they are very welcome to participate. Okay, so hello, hello. We're really excited um, to be here with you all. I'm Melissa Giroux. I'm a co-founder of uh, Embrace Race, and I'm a mixed race, black, white woman. And I'm Andrew works. Grant Thomas. I am uh, the other co-founder. I identify as Black or African-American, and I'm he, him. And uh, we have two kids. We're also uh, a couple in life, so we have a couple kids who actually have not been making noise during webinars lately. So we're pretty... We've, They're we've, growing up. We've reached a new uh, point in their lives. It's exciting. So today, um, you are here for lights, cameras, representation, raising racially just kids in today's media environment. Um, and we're very um, excited because we've got some guests who've thought a lot about this. Uh, you all know as, um, as teachers, as parents, as folks raising kids, that there you really have to search often, um, whether it's books or um, uh, you know, ed educational materials, apps, um, YouTube uh, videos, and on television to, to find uh, diverse racial representation in children's media. And, uh, but we know that no matter how much we try to surround our kids with diverse representations, that oftentimes um, they're sort of drawn in by TV and, and movies, or they'll go to a party and they'll watch something that actually is not very representative. And, and uh, it has a huge effect on them, as do other forms of media advertisements and all of that. Um, so we're excited to, uh, to talk to a few guests about that. Um, according to Common Sense Media, two to eight-year-old children in the US spent an average of nearly three hours every day on screen media alone in 2017. And of course, that's increased with COVID. So uh, the conversation is, is even 
more important. Um, I'm going to let Andrew introduce our guests and we want to talk about the media landscape and about um, what that means for parenting, for activism around kids' media. Andrew, take it away. Yeah, glad to have these folks here. The first guest I'll introduce, Marcy Gunther, who is the Director of Media Development for Children's Media and Senior Producer at WGBH in Boston. Uh, Marcy is a multi Emmy award winning producer with over 20 years of experience developing and producing educational children's media. Uh, in addition to overseeing GBH's development slate for children's media, Marcy was senior producer on the first season of the groundbreaking PBS kids series, Molly of Denali, which was the first nationally distributed children's series in the US to feature an Alaska native lead character. She's also worked on Zoom, on Sesame Street, on Arthur and more. Really glad, had an amazing conversation with Marcy before this. Really glad to have you here, Marcy. Thanks for coming. Be here. Also, Marcy's joined by Candace Howes, who's a North Carolina-based writer and activist and multimedia artist. Uh, Candace's advocacy work began in 2016 when she authored a change.org petition regarding police brutality, which received 40,000 signatures. She's currently co-organizing a petition to address ethnic stereotypes in film and television. Welcome, uh, Candace. And- Thanks for having me. Good to, good to have you here, Candace. Uh, and also, Hemant Shaw, who has been a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison since 1990. Hemant teaches and conducts research on race, ethnicity, and media, international communication, uh, and a teaching symposium for graduate students. Dr. Shaw has conducted research on the representation of non-white racial and ethnic groups in the news and entertainment media, and frequently collaborates with students and local media organizations to devise strategies to help media do a better job of covering and depicting non-white racial and ethnic groups, Clearly these folks uh, bring it all uh, with respect to the topic we're discussing today. I'm gonna to jump right in and start with the place that we like to start, which is for each of you, um, and Candace, I'll start with you. Uh, tell us a little something about how you come to this issue of race and representation in television and, and, and screen media in general. Yeah, um, so I was actually a, freshman in college, um, the year that George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin, I was studying film and communications. Um, and that incident really sparked my interest in advocacy and social justice work um, related to media. Um, so I started the petition with the police body cams a couple of years later. Um, and I've been writing just kind of editorials and articles since then um, in places like MTV and Huffington Post. Um, and one of my co-organizers um, contacted me this summer through one of those articles and shared with me the uh, information she had found regarding racism in children's media. And I instantly knew that um, it was something that was interesting to me and that I wanted to help with. So we've kind of joined forces um, with another indie filmmaker and um, that was kind of what sparked the petition. Yeah, and I should say too that uh, Candace and her colleagues reached out to us uh, and that was the impetus for, for actually this program. So really appreciate your doing that, Candace. Uh, Hammond, let me go to you. How did you get into this work? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't, uh, to be honest, I wasn't always interested in this topic. I, uh, growing up or even in college, uh, what changed things was when my daughter was born uh, in 1989, and uh, I joined Wisconsin, as Andrew said, in 1990, and I, I remember two specific kind of incidents. One, uh, I was watching television with my daughter, and for some reason, there was a Western on, <laughs> and uh, she piped us and said, literally said this, how come the Indians always lose? <laughs> and uh, it was a Cowboys and Indians movie, and she said, how come the Indians always lose? And and I also, the other thing that happened was what we were, I had taken her to see Aladdin, the movie Aladdin in 19, the animated version. And, mm -hmm. and I was struck by the opening scene where um, the narrator refers to the, uh, this fictional Middle Eastern country as barbaric and backward. And it just kind of struck me that, well, here's my kid uh, taking in these messages. And so I did started, I started reading more about it and thinking more about it and, and eventually 
and by the mid nineties, I was teaching a course in my department on, on race, ethnicity and media. And um, so, and I haven't looked back since. I used to continue to teach those courses and, and, write, and, and write about them, uh, academic research and working with community groups as Andrew mentioned. So that's my story. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I love that it started with your daughter's observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Marcy, how about you? Yeah, I feel very uh, lucky and privileged to have spent most of my career working in public media, uh, where really our mission has always been to uh, really create media that serves the very uh, diverse audience that public media serves. So I think uh, my first job out of college was actually working on Sesame Street. Um, and uh, from there, I went on to work on uh, the very first season of Arthur, which is now in its 24th season. So you can do the math there. And then another new um, kids show called, well, at the time was new, called Zoom, um, which was actually a reboot of, of the Zoom from the 1970s, um, which was really for kids, by kids, and you know, especially the 1970s Zoom was very seminal in that it really showed a, a representative cast of, of kids, um, real kids, not actors, um, with a lot of representation. Um, so that's how I got my start. Um, and most recently, um, I had the uh, wonderful experience of working on the first season of Molly of Denali. Um, and like Andrew said, it was the first, it's the first um, kid show to feature an Alaska native uh, character. Um, so again, I feel like I've been kind of doing this work for a while now. Um, and I feel very lucky to have um, the opportunity and, and, and a sense of responsibility to really uh, create media where where all kids can see themselves. I mean, I, I think we've probably, we've heard that saying, if you if you see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. And I know Candace and Hamant, you'll talk about the importance of kids seeing themselves positively mm -hmm. depicted in media. And we've just heard countless stories from kids over the years about how impactful that is. Right. We'll definitely come yeah, to that. yeah, we definitely want to go there now. Um, and I want to go to you, Hamant, about, um, just to ask what the stakes are for kids. You know, how how bad is it in terms of racial representation in kids' media? And why is racial representation important for kids? Yeah. Let's get into the beginnings here. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I think it matters a lot uh, yeah. about how kids are viewing, uh, whether it's, you know, animation or, or not, uh, what they're viewing in terms of the re representation of race, race and ethnicity. Um, I think uh, at the most general level, I think it's really important because I think kids can sort of uh, learn and see what, what's their future going to be in, a, in society. Are they going to be part of a, a healthy multicultural society or are they going to be part of a more hierarchically, hierarchically organized society in which um, kids of color are not valued or, or depicted in, in problematic ways. Um, but specifically, there's different things that kids pick up, I think, when they watch, um, uh, when they see stereotypes of, of uh, people of color in movies and film and, and other places. Um, you know, they might see depictions of heroes and villains, for example. Um, you know, like the, the story I told about my daughter noticing right away that the, the Native Americans never win. <laughs> Uh, those kind of things, or they may believe that uh, stereotypes are, are actual, actually real. Um, and there is research suggesting that those adults and kids, those who watch um, TV, for example, uh, heavily and continuously are more likely to believe that what they see on TV is, is real, is actual, actually reflecting reality. And of course, that has, I think, impacts that uh, we can all, all think about and that child psychologists have, uh, have their research. Um, and I think it also has an impact on, on white kids who are watching these, these, uh, this programming, that they learn how to behave perhaps towards uh, kids of color. Um, they may not feel they have to intervene when they see acts of racism or acts of bias, uh, things like that. 
So, uh, uh, so in a nutshell, I think it's really, really important for us to think through these issues uh, and pay attention to how uh, people, um, uh, producers are also depicting, are also making decisions about how to depict these issues. I'm sure Marcy can, can talk a lot about that. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go to to Candice to see if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that when we're dealing, especially with kids, like the stakes are very high, you know, kids are in front of screens, you know, four and five hours a day, um, kind of, as you mentioned earlier, even more since the pandemic. Um, and I think what's more concerning for us is like, adults or as educators is like the content of what they're watching more than the hours, you know, because for a kid, this is like their window to the world of understanding, you know, our roles in society, how we're expected to act. Um, so if there's any type of like stereotyping, racism, direct, nuanced on a screen, a kid already understands, you know, like Hamid mentioned, the hierarchy that they're seeing. Um, and what's important is that kids pick up on these things so fast. Yeah. So if you can imagine like your child getting on the school bus for the very first time, they already have an understanding of like, where do I fit into society? You know, what is my place, so to speak? Um, so I think the the stakes are incredibly high. You know, if there's negative imagery, that's going to affect, especially for um, black and brown kids. You know, we're talking mental health issues, depression, anxiety, physical health issues. Um, but what's so great, what I love about media and the power of it is that conversely, if we think about positive images, we can also create you know, youth who have higher levels of self-esteem, who are more empathetic individuals. Um, and that's really a benefit to all of us as a society that, you know, we're creating content that create that produces, um, you know, better individuals in society who can ultimately create, you know, a better landscape for us. That's and so you powerful. Know, yeah. And, you know, Candace and Hemant, I mean, you both, you know, Candace, you use the phrase window in the world, you know, Hemant, Hemant you made a sort of a similar point. And, you know, I think, a really hugely important backdrop of that, right, is is social segregation, right? The fact that we and our cross, I mean, we remain remarkably segregated residentially in terms of school, but perhaps even more fundamentally socially, right? So if we don't get to know each other as friends, as intimates, as right, then yeah, then it seems that the the uh, the, the window in the world that books and movies and television offer then has an even larger role in determining and shaping how we think about each other. You know, Marcy, I'd love to come to you um, with this next question because, you know, we know that, of course, you had George Floyd's murder and the protests, but before that, Black Lives Matter, right? The ex escalating conversation about race under Trump, um, you know, uh, Barack Obama's, right? So the, for there are all these reasons why the, the conversation about race has been heightened. Lots of institutions are responding to that. I'm wondering, yeah, or is, it tell, is your industry responding to it and what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think the, the industry definitely, you know, even before this past summer, you know, but I think even more so there's, there's a, a bit of a, a reckoning and a, you know, I think that, you know, and I'm talking about how beyond just children's media, I think Hollywood in general, I think the statistics are, you know, uh, that, you know, more than 90% of Hollywood showrunners are white and a vast majority of those are men. Um, so clearly, you know, the industry has, as a whole, has a lot of catching up to do. Um, but I do see, and, you know, more and more um, in, in, a, in a positive direction that I think broadcasters and many, you know, I have the privilege of working for PBS and we don't, have to be driven by market forces, but some of the commercial uh, broadcasters, that is more of a concern. They're waking up to the message of, you know, be more diverse or get left behind that. And I think the work um, that you've been doing, Candace, in really making it and known, and I think this is where parents um, and caregivers and educators have such a strong voice and social media has given us such a a powerful voice to, to tell um, broadcasters what you want to see more of and what you don't, um, you know, and I think, you know, we can make our voices heard, you know, through social media, also through our eyeballs. Now there's more competition than ever for 
um, those eyeballs uh, because there's so many platforms and everybody wants you there watching their platform um, and also your wallets. I mean, I think we saw the tremendous success of Black Panther, um, which is such a great example, I think, of, of representation done right um, and really, um, you know, at all levels of the production. Um, but it was a, also an incredible box office success. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, and you know, very powerful. Um, and I think that, you know, again, I think there's a lot of catching up to do, but I think that the industry as a whole understands that we need, we need BIPOC executives, development executives, creators, writers, artists, you know, designers, animators, um, musicians, um, and, and that's that's where we need to go. So let, me, um, let me let me ask you a quick follow up, Marcy. Yeah. Um, because right, so you started out describing really some I would say external pressures, right? So some consumer driven yep. pressures, uh, and and you ended saying you know increasingly there are folks, increasing number of folks in your industry understand that we need more of these things. Certainly diversity at every level and so on. If we knew what you knew. Right, about what's going on in the industry, would we feel encouraged about how many people, how many particular right, studios, et cetera, you know, perhaps outside PBS, um, really actually also want to do the right thing, understand, apart from you know, market pressures, et cetera, that they need to step up and, and how important are taking responsibility for their impact on, on kids and others? Yeah, I think, you know, everyone, well, I, I'm an eternal optimist and I, so that, that might be to my detriment at times, but I do think people want to do the right thing, but I think, you know, we have to create avenues um, and on-ramps to bring new voices and new creators and, and, you know, we need to, you know, I think there's a process that is happening um, and, you know, I think that it, it is happening. And I think we're gonna see more and more and more. If you look at what Netflix has coming up on their slate and PBS and mm -hmm. Apple TV Plus, you know, there's some really rich, wonderful content that's coming our way mm -hmm. um, soon. And I think we'll be seeing more and more of it. And Hemant, from your perspective as an right, external observer, you know, are you teaching uh, somewhat differently in your classes now because of what you're seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, it's true. I mean, I, I think uh, progress um, has been made. I think there's no doubt about it. If I look at it historically, obviously there's been a lot of progress. We don't see the more, the most egregious stereotypes anymore. You know, we don't see the um, you know, the step and fetch it character for African Americans or the um, uh, the, the, the yellow peril, uh, Asian, you know, those type of things, uh, the, the dragon lady, you know, those type of things we don't see. But I, I say to my class usually that the story is two steps forward, one step back, that uh, we're making progress is very, very slowly. Yes, it's getting more diverse in management in some industries, but not all. Uh, but we, regardless, we do, we have other issues that have to be addressed in, the, in terms of the depiction of, of uh, BIPOC uh, people. And that is things like, for example, colorism is still a problem where light-skinned uh, minorities get cast, uh, tend to get cast more, more, more so than, than others. Um, the distribution of roles uh, is really interesting because for example, if you look on TV, in TV, where, where do you find uh, African-Americans? You find them in comedies mainly, and rarely in drama. Sometimes you do, but, but so, so that's a kind of a, a problem that still has to be dealt with. The issue of whitewashing, where studios uh, elect to cast white actors in, in roles that were maybe written to be uh, African-American or Native American or Asian-American, whatever it might be. Um, and, and there's also this final problem that I always talk about in my classes, when, uh, when, when white people do good things on TV, it's, it's attributed to their group culture, 
But if a if an African American, I mean, sorry, the other way around. If an African American does something bad on TV, it's it's a group culture, right? Uh, but if something good happens by an African American, well, it was mainly some due to some uh, some some contextual factors, you know. Though, so it's very subtle, but it kind of uh, conveys this idea that uh, success by some groups is due to their individual traits and. Uh, lack of success is due to group traits. You know, it's a kind of a uh, a problem that uh, has to be dealt with too. But as I said, uh, my bottom line to my in my classes is progress is being made, but we have to be very aware of the kind of progress that it is, and that problems remain to be tackled. Right, right. So um, we're going to ask you a few more questions and then um, open up the questions to others. So those of you who want to ask questions to the panelists, you can put them in the Q&A folder um, if you're in Zoom. And of course, ask each other questions in the chat and all that. So um, one of the things on that point of it getting more subtle that drives me kind of nuts is, um, you know, having, it's almost like the Benetton version of a show where it's really diverse, but um, there's still, the the story is still white centered, you know, that it's always, so the message is always, you know, um, if you're black, you know, stand back, or if you're a person of color, you're kind of uh, the friend or, um, you know, just someone who's not to be focused on, you know, you're not the star of the story. So um, I, I think that that's happening. I think that happens a lot, even though we see um, a lot more folks of color in uh, kids media. I'm still seeing that. And I'm talking about mostly on sort of like a Disney or something. It's almost like the same story, but it's uh, there are people of color in it and it feels really wrong. Um, but I'm wondering, I'm gonna put you guys on the spot and I'm just wondering, uh, Candace, I'll start with you. If there are kids shows that you, you're seeing out there that you think really are getting race right. And I know no show's perfect, but. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that there's a lot and I'm probably definitely more um, aware of probably films that I think do a good job even more so than TV. Um, but I definitely think, you know, films like Coco, um, you know, Hidden Figures, Black Panther, those are all great examples. Um, there's a lot of great shows that you can probably find on um, places like streaming sites, you know, there's a lot of initiatives like Strong Black Lead on Netflix. Um, I think This Is Us is a fantastic family show that deals with a lot of racial issues really well. Um, but honestly, I think any time we're watching TV or movies is a really great time to talk about race, right? Um, just because whether a show is doing something really well or whether it's kind of leaning towards something that's problematic, it's just a fantastic time to kind of take that moment and discuss with your kids, you know, what does society look like? How do we treat one another? Um, Andrew made a fantastic point about, you know, our social lives being very self-segregated from schools to so many different communities. So that means that a lot of us, people of color, white individuals, we're all kind of getting a lot of information about different ethnic groups through the screen. And so that means a lot of times we're getting perceptions built that aren't true. Um, so it's really important when you're thinking about, you know, watching any film with your kids that you are discussing with them, you know, younger kids, if you see something that's not right, you know, kind of think of it like a scary movie, you know, hey, that's not real, that's not something we do. Um, if you've got older kids, you can kind of draw comparisons to things that have happened in your community or on the news, um, but just always be very clear about endorsing or condemning what you see you know don't let it always be a negative conversation because there's really great movies and tv out there um so even if you see something that's great it's like hey you know make sure you point that out because kids you know recognize things that are positive just as much as they do um negative things mm -hmm. we we were one of the just bringing up sort of an example like that um one of the things that we were noticing with our kids and sort of pointing out was the stereotype of the uh, quirky genius who's always a white man. Mm -hmm. you know, and we uh, found this, we heard from people we know, oh gosh, there's this great detective show that's set in St. Lucia. And you know, there's so much culturally from that, you know, we have uh, family from the islands and all that. And so we were so excited to watch it. And guess what? They had a British guy from off island come in in the middle of the first show to take over and be the quirky genius. And the kids were genius. like, oh, I can't Not believe it. So, 
So we had a lot of sort of fun with it as well. I mean, I know that we got some questions yeah. from um, people registering, like, how do you not, you know, uh, how do you spoil, how do you not spoil the fun? Because they're, they're sort of, you don't have yeah. to maybe with the bathwater because there can be good things. And there were some great characters mm -hmm. in that show in particular. So we were able to do both, but it was essential to sort of watch it together. But you know what? When every every episode, right, you, you get the, the, the great reveal, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. this, the British white guy is yeah. the one who figures it out. Yeah. And he doesn't even offer the reveal to his colleagues of color, right? We need to go to the scene and everyone's there and they learn along with us. Right. I mean, it's actually mm -hmm. so offensive. You could offensive. have told us. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Marcy, I wonder if you have recommendations as well. Um, I... I have some, some I, I have to say are shows that <laughs> are PBS. <laughs> yeah, that's that's um, I think if you haven't seen Molly of Denali, I think, you know, that is a show that, and again, I think the reason that it does culture, it, it, it is such a, an, a great depiction of Alaska Native culture is that Alaska Natives really, created this show. Um, you know, we used our expertise in children's media and animation and storytelling, but we really co-created this show with Alaska Native community. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's why the show is as rich as it, it is. And in its second season, I think almost half of the writers are Alaska Native. Um, and, and, and I think that, that, you know, what you were talking about, about that white centered mm -hmm. experience that even when you're trying to tell a culturally relevant story, we all have to own our, our lens and our bias and where we're coming from and be open and willing to hand over the mic and say, I want you to, to tell this story. This is not my story to tell. Um, and what a much better show it might have been to have um, that detective show, um, you know, from the perspective of, uh, you know, uh, someone who was native to the island and that was their lived experience. Because I think, um, I'm not really answering your question, but I think that um, when stories are lived experience and they come from a, a place of um it's so rich and i think i am i am molly i think is an example of that i think there's other wonderful um i've seen some great books in the list i think there's other wonderful media out there for kids um you know i think doc mcstuffins is another example um, of a show that's been very transformative for young children. I think Daniel Tiger does a wonderful job um, about talking about race to very young kids. Um, so I think there is, and, and I can come up with a longer list, but I think there, there are some good resources out there. And we are getting some love for uh, Molly <laughs> Denali. Um, you see um, uh, Dino Dan Dana. Uh, Dino Dana. Sorry, Dino yeah, Dana. I don't know that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Molly. Uh, and, you know, so you've already, I'm you sorry. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Molly. Yeah. Uh, Molly. Um, so you've already, all three of you have spoken to this already. We'd, we'd love to hear um, some more wisdom on what we can do about all this, right? To further push, you know, the ball in the right direction, right? The racing representation ball. And there are at least two levels, feel free to speak to, to either. Um, you know, one is, yeah, what can, you know, parents, educators, you know, adults in homes and in, in schools do, right? So with one-on-one -on -one child with, you know, groups of children, uh, that's one level. The other is, you know, more what you, the, the work that you're doing, Candice. Um, you know, what can we do to sort of push the, yeah, the executives and the, the studio leaders and, you know, make the more structural push? Um, Hammond, let me start with you, you know, on, on either, either or both of those. What, what are some things that those of us who are listening, what can we do? Yeah, I, I, uh, well, I, I tend to capture these approaches in, what I, in, uh, in, the, in the phrase uh, media literacy. And, um, and, and 
it, I'm sure many academic fields conduct research on this topic, but it, in my field, journalism and mass communication, uh, the research definitely shows that if people come to the TV viewing context um, with some background knowledge about the history of stereotypes, um, the uh, ways that uh, media work, how decisions are made, um, what you know, the, the role of corporate media, et cetera, all of those kind of things. If they come to the viewing context with some of that in mind, there's a tendency for the stereotypic thinking to be inhibited. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, so experimental research has shown that. Um, kind of uh, close close studies, uh, uh, observational studies with kids have shown that. So, so I think that's really important and that does put it on, on me and my colleagues as educators. Uh, of course, we're at the college level, but, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do there, believe me, uh, about uh, kind of uh, uh, telling people what, what is the history of this particular type of uh, imagery? Why did it exist? Uh, and how might it affect people today and why is it relevant today? So we have to talk about white centrality and, um, and about uh, the, the negative impact that stereotypes can have on thinking and behavior and so forth. So it's, it's a semester long process for me usually. Uh, and, uh, but, but of course then they go away and, and, um, and, and do whatever they're going to do in college. So it's, uh, the, I think for me, the challenge is how do we do it uh, over a long period of time and in, and in a context other than the classroom. And I, and I know that uh, you, uh, you two have done a lot of work with other uh, educators you know, and caregivers. So I think it has to happen at multiple points. And that's, that's uh, uh, and my, you know, my focus has been on uh, freshman level education, but there's a lot more work to be done other places. So, but I think media literacy in general is, is my, is where I, uh, is my, is my starting point. That's great, Hammond. Thank you. And, you know, the, um, that point that you made, you know, Marcy, makes me think of uh, the conversation we had before where you talked, among other things, you talked about, um, you know, and you alluded to here or two a little bit about you know, how, what had happened behind the scenes in, right? So this idea that these are productions, they are creations, people are, real people are doing this. And who's doing it, it's not all that matters, but certainly who's doing it really matters. And you talked a bit about how the cast, right? So you talk, you know, anyway, so the cast of characters creating this had changed over time. That takes deliberate work, it's deliberate effort, and indeed you generate a different product. But what, what do you have to say uh, yeah, about how we move this ball? Um, I actually also feel like it's media literacy. Um, and I think that's why the work um, both of my uh, co-panelists are doing is so important. Um, and, and really teaching kids media literacy skills from preschool. You know, I think we've learned and the research shows that kids at a very young age are aware of race and racism and, you know, and parents really starting those conversations right then. Um, and really, I think, you know, when you see it, something that you don't like, that's, and I think you said this, Candace, that's, that's an opportunity to have a conversation about what that was and how did that make you feel and, and what did you see and, and how, how could they have done this differently? I mean, I think we all, you know, I think we are, you know, now with remote schooling and, you know, so much of the way we're consuming education even is through media that, you know, we have to teach kids and parents um, how to have these conversations with their kids mm -hmm. and be critical, you know, media viewers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marcy and Candice. Um, and feel free if you'd like to say a bit more about the petition, mm -hmm. you know, how it's going, what do you hope to accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, yeah, I think there's like two probably really, I think important things that we can like all do just in this landscape. And um, I think one of those is remembering that film and like television, it is a business, you know, um, I think Marcy mentioned earlier, you know, the idea, you know, where we're putting our, our views and our streams and our dollars is so important because, you know, we have the narrative in the industry that, you know, 
shows and films that have black and brown leads, you know, they're not going to be profitable. And as consumers, you know, if we're making a point to seek out, you know, media that is produced by um, BIPOC creators who are putting out, you know, positive representations, we're really, you know, flipping that idea on its head that, you know, people do want to see, you know, different people, you know, who would have thought, right? So it's really important that, you know, the way we're engaging with media um, is a great way that we can make a change, you know, in the industry. And obviously, advocacy is a huge part of that. Um, so, you know, finding and supporting organizations that are creating content that are putting pressure on the industry. Um, and that's really what um, our petition was all about was just seeing the effects that media has on kids and saying, you know, you know, we want to draw attention to the fact that we've got disclaimers already, you know, that warn us as parents about, you know, harmful imagery, imagery, mature content, but we're really doing ourselves a disservice to leave, you know, racial stereotyping out of that discussion. Um, so the petition is really all about getting places like the MPAA and different studios to identify, you know, racial content Emotion in their rating system. Of America. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Motion Picture Association of America, um, just to, you know, help us to identify these things, um, you know, and as we mentioned, again, just reiterating that idea of media literacy, you know, it's not intuitive to think intentionally about something that you're watching for fun, but, you know, as adults, we have to do that so we can teach kids to have um, more agency over what they're watching. So any type of advocacy or support that you can give to organizations um, is really important. And I'll drop the link to the petition in the chat as well for anyone who's interested. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we have a lot of questions and um, a lot of questions about also about what, uh, what to do, what the implications of all this are for parents, for teachers um, in, and you've already spoken a bit about it, about sort of uh, media literacy. Um, so I wonder, if there are sort of more specific tips, like what are the, uh, you, you, I, I could already draw them up from what you're saying that um, talk about whose story is it, talk about um, who's, who produced this, uh, what's their context, who's paying for this, you know, um, uh, are, there, are there other suggestions if, if you're, I mean, I think a lot of our questions from before are also about um, you know, my kids attracted to media that isn't fantastic racially, you know, and um, do I not let them watch it, you know, or, and of course that would change with different ages, or do I, it, would you all uh, suggest instead that you watch it with them, which is um, the thing that I try to do more um, instead of using, you know, TV as a babysitter, which I am guilty of sometimes, you know, of really realizing, wow, they're watching this without me and it'd be better for them to watch it with me. Um, so I don't know anyone who wants to jump in on more specific, you know, whether to prepare or protect your kid from media or, you know, what the, what your tendencies would be, what your suggestions would be. Yeah. Yeah, Hammond, please. yeah I, um, I think I personally have erred on the side of watching with uh, when my daughter was growing up. I mean, as much as possible, to the extent possible, when she's watching something, was watching something at home, um, I would try, we, uh, you know, we would try to, to do it together uh, without um, ruining the experience. And of course, that's what she would always ex accuse us of, well, you've ruined the show for me now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do that all the time. I, yeah, right. And, we but, but I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but what I've learned is that now she she's now thirty one. So um, something has something stuck because uh, she now watches media very critically as well. And I'm I'm not taking all the credit for it, obviously, because she's you know she had a uh, you know uh, uh, other other influences. But I think, um, I think it's important to do that, um, watch with them as the mediator, so to speak, or, or the interpreter or whatever it might be. And I've even um, advised some folks to, to, to literally, if they're watching, if you have a pause button, <laughs> pause, just pause the movie or pause the show. And you know, what, what did you think about that? You know, that piece of 
uh, acting or that piece of that or that scene. Um, you get you will get uh, stares, you will get uh, uh, pushback, but um, it's kind of worth it if you do it strategically and um, not too often, so that it has an impact when you do when you do do it. The other thing I would just say, if I can uh, just add one more thing, is that I I um, with my students, I often do what, what we call a content audit. I, I, it's an assignment where they actually have to watch some primetime show and keep track of the characters and what they do. And um, if, if they're in positions of power, do they take orders or give orders? Are they cast as heroes? You know, do they control their destiny? Just like the story you told about, uh, about the uh, quirky scientists always being white. You know, the, but um, the thing I have discovered is that a lot of students, light bulbs go off for them when they do it in a systematic way like that as an assignment, uh, and it sticks. They can still watch leisurely at their, you know, on their own time, uh, but it does stick. I often get comments after the after you know several semesters after a given class that hey, I still I watched this show the other day and it had these stereotypes. I remembered your class, you know, so it does tend to stick. Uh, but it's a, you have to do it over time, I guess is, is the point. It's just not a one, 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 one shot and, and done. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hammond. You know, here's a, here's a question I love that uh, talks about class representation mm -hmm. and the cl class by race kind of reputation, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you make of current representations of class diversity in media? I think of the 1970s, 80s representation of poor and working class striving black families in Sanford and Son, right? Good Times, the Jeffersons, that gave way to uh, more representations of middle class, even upper middle class families like the Cosbys, right, in the 80s. What about now? Are you seeing more acceptance of class diversity alongside or, right, cross hatched with uh, positive racial ethnic representative diversity? Marcy, let me. Uh, I'm going to take that. Oh, sure. Continue. You? you know, that's a very interesting question. And I haven't, I can't say that I have looked at that with a, with a wide lens. Um, you know, I think one of the, sorry, I'm going to talk about Molly of Denali again. I apologize, everyone. But one of the things, one of the many reasons we wanted to create this show was it was also showing a rural, um, a rural community. And so often, you know, shows are set in cities and or you know at, at, or they're set in sub, you know a lot of primetime television is set in suburbia so I don't know that we've made um a ton of progress there but I haven't looked at it closely so I'd be curious Cand Candace and Mom to know what you think of that yeah I would definitely say I think there's a lot of progress to be made because I think um you're absolutely right. Yeah, we went from kind of a lot of working class, especially thinking about families of color on TV to showing like upper middle class. I think we're at a little bit of a, a stagnant point now where we're not seeing always as many shows. Um, I think about TV shows like Fresh Off the Boat or like Blackish, who I think are doing like a good job of trying to show that. But I still think that there's a lack of diversity, like Marcy mentioned, in ge uh, geographically. But I also think there's lack of diversity in there's still kind of the concept of like the educated families are always living in the big house and like doing really well and like the poor families are uneducated and there's really no middle you know in between where those places intersect um so I think we have a long way to go in content creation of showing just the diversity of families um economically as well as like socially and intellectually mm -hmm. yeah so um so again Lots of questions here about, um, you know, with, uh, here's one, can you speak to how we educate younger children about the history of race in America uh, beyond MLK and Rosa Parks? And is that happening in media that you all have seen? I mean, I think now is the moment when you're hearing about people uh, who aren't more and more like uh, Claudine Colvin or, um, you're hearing about uh, Polly Murray and just people who were important but weren't recognized, so they're not. Um, yeah, but that's a, that's. I mean, you know, it also makes me think of, and this was mentioned earlier about the proliferation of media, 
right? Just right. just in terms of television and cable television. I mean, and YouTube, which means that you can, yes, you can find certainly more of that if you're so inclined, and you can readily avoid it if you're not. <laughs> so, which is, you know, for the good and and for the bad. Yeah. Um, I think if there's anyone in the chat who has uh, suggestions also, we'd love to, you know, we, we definitely, if we, if we don't read the chat during, although we do have folks in the chat, um, but we definitely look at that afterwards and can uh, compile stuff. So if there are, if my, if that question can be answered through the YouTube, you just let us know. There's a question that I'm uh, not, oh yes, here. Um, it's a question about, you know, if there's a difference between the progress we've made in the children's book industry mm -hmm. versus children's, you know, screen media. And um, mm -hmm. again, no reason you would have expertise in, in children's books, but the, the specific question is there's more progress. Um, Angela believes that there's more progress toward diversity and inclusion in children's books uh, that are, have been and are being published. I'm so pleased with picture books and middle school books. Uh, that I purchased to give away to, to children during these COVID months. So I guess there are two questions. One is, is that is that square with your sense? All right, are we are we doing better uh, in children's books than in children's movies and, and and TV shows? And to the extent that that's true, why would that be? Is there something we can learn? Right, when we think about applying pressure to screen media from the progress made in in books. Anyone want to give that a shot? Um, I'll just say that I think that, you know, I think um, I'm not sure about the answer to that in terms of like, is, is one is one advancing faster than the other? I mean, I'm excited too about what I'm seeing in the children's uh, book industry and market. Um, and so many new voices and new talent um, being published. And, you know, I think what you're gonna see is a lot of those books get optioned <laughs> and turned into television and movies. I do think that the lift to create um, a television show, the investment is, is greater. It takes longer sometimes to get those things from development to being on the air. Um, even under the best circumstances, you have all the money, you have everything you need, you know, the creating um, a film or a television show can take, you know, two years. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, we can catch up and, you know, and that, and, and that we can fuel each other. And like I said, I think, um, you know, there's more, more great content, um, is in the in the marketplace if you look at just it as all media whether it's you know consumed through a screen or through you know an actual physical object is is a wonderful thing right um so here's a question um that sort of goes back to something that you did say but is asking in a different way i meant i'm thinking of what you said about your college class um is it possible to critically examine popular media together as a family yeah, still ingest these pieces as fun family entertainment. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think? Well, you try, you try, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, and I, I and I think uh, a lot depends on the kid. A lot depends on on uh, what mood the kid is in. <laughs> um, it's it's a tough question. I think it's something that has. To, I mean, I don't have any kind of two or three ideas to make that work every time. I think you have to keep trying. And um, and just hope that you know some things are sinking in, and, and I, I I have some optimism that it does sink in with kids uh, yeah. because of what I see later, you know, when the kids are older or even get into college, you, you know, some have had that experience um, and are aware of issues and problems that, that they should uh, attend to. But uh, um, no, <laughs> I don't have any <laughs> two or three kind of magic recommendations that to have that work, except to say, just, I think it's important to try. Yeah, and I think that's right, that there isn't a recipe, right? Because you know your kid and you know mm -hmm. that kid's, or your students and you know their context. And 
you yeah. it's going to be different on a different day you know their disposition mm -hmm. but i've definitely i had an increasingly had these experiences where um i mean one example that i've spoken about before is um hamilton the musical and i at first you know didn't want to expose my because i knew that there was so much left out historically and it was again sort of founder chic and then a friend of mine said oh but you it's a work of art like he's a genius your kids have to you know you have you know and i sort of thought what is she saying and i started to listen myself and i realized wow he really is a genius like just musically and my kids respond so well so much to music and it was just so complicated and um we loved it but it did create great opportunities for talking about um who's missing in that and even in our case of our family uh, our families who a lot of them you know half of my family's from the caribbean and um hamilton was from the was lived in the caribbean and andrew's also uh from jamaica originally and so we could talk about like well where was our family there and why aren't there why is he the one who comes over and um and 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 the sally hemmings thing and then and and even to talk about like yeah you know um you know how we were talking about how about textbooks and how um people aren't taught um they're taught a sort of a whitewashed version of American history. Well, guess what? So was Lin Manuel. He, Lin Manuel Miranda went to American schools too, you know, and he got like a very whitewashed view of history. So, and that was a and that was a real, um, you know, sort of Achilles heel in in creating that. I think, but even that's really fascinating, right? Like, oh, that he did. He made this beautiful thing anyway, and there's been a reckoning even for him, right? Of like, oh, what did I? Why did I con count on Ron Chern, you know, this particular historian and what did he know and what were his, his biases? So I think it can become, it can still be fun. I mean, we like sing those songs still all the time and act it out and all of that. And we, but we problematize it as well, you know, and mm -hmm. sure, sure they do often say, you know, you ruined X, Y, Z for me, but we also, we also laugh together quite a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, we're we're almost at time. I wanted to um, maybe Marcy and Candace especially put one last question to you, and and it goes back to the issue of um, you know whether or not there are change makers within the industry, right? So I'm wondering, for example, mm -hmm. Candace, you know, have you had responses, right, from sort of producers yeah. to the petition that would make us feel better? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and Marcy, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, PBS, of course, is known as a leader in education in general uh, of children, but certainly the, the kind of shows that you've worked on, you know, in the space of diversity and representation. I'm wondering if the for-profit uh, folks are reaching, have reached out to you and said, we want to do this better. Can you help us? So Candice, let me start with you, just anything you can share. Yeah, um, so we have have not gotten a lot of producer feedback yet. Um, and I think that's something that we're definitely pushing for and trying to do because, you know, we know it's not going to be an easy battle by any means. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of creators out there who are trying to do more. Um, and one thing that I'm hoping is that we're seeing you know, more creators, more studios who want to create content for children specifically, because I think there is a push to create better representation in Hollywood in general, but not always geared specifically towards kids. Um, so I definitely, you know, that's my hope and I'm optimistic um, because we have gotten a lot of positive feedback in general that we'll get more, you know, inside experts who are who are willing to to work with it. Um, I have to say, you know, I am a, a PBS Kids, you know, person myself. Grew up on everything, so um, I know just how you know positive and impactful um, and life changing having that kind of representation is. Thank you, Candice. Marcy, any any thoughts? Yeah, I can tell you there are change makers out there because I know a lot of them, and I think there's some really exciting. You know, and there's many, many more that I don't know and I'm excited to meet. Um, I think that there are, you know, there's some there's some good things happening. And, you know, I think I saw somewhere in the chat, you know, how can how can we I mean, I feel like part of my job being at the place in my career that I am is how do we bring how do we bring the next generation in and how do we open things up and how do we um, 
you know, create, you know, more opportunities for, for new creators and BIPOC creators that, that may not, you know, see them, see the road for them. And I think that, you know, that's really important to our industry is how do we bring and keep and get that new talent and um i think there's you're gonna again it's it television does take a while so we have to be a little patient but i think there's some really exciting things happening um and we need to keep finding new ways to to kind of bring more 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 people to you know the to the the industry um and i think the industry knows that and is is looking at that um in meaningful ways you know before we uh we thank you for all the information and the insights and guidance you've given us i want folks to know that next monday and thursday we have uh, more webinars coming up uh on monday right both are about how do we nurture resilience and joy in young Black Indigenous children and children of color and among them, right? And, and among them, so how they see each other. How do we support them to recognize each other's full humanity? We have two programs. The Monday one focuses on what parents and caregivers can do, what their needs are in doing this work. And the Thursday one focuses on educators and especially early childhood parents and educators, zero to eight. Uh, is the is the age of the children we're we're looking at? So um, you can go to our website and uh, sign up for that. And always you can go and uh, get the archive, the recording, the transcript. Very soon after each um, program, we have the transcript. We have the recording available to you, right, including this one. Thank you so much, um, Marcy, Candice, Hemant, everyone who joined. Um, this recording will, you know, also uh, be up in the transcript um, as soon as we have that up. We really uh, appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness and, and your work that you brought. Yeah, and, and your work. work. Yeah, you're thank creating you. good stuff and good people. So thank you so much. You rock. Thanks so much. Good night. Bye, folks. Good night.